So this is for my buddy Craig, <laughs> since he's not here. And we're back. <laughs> he loves doing that. Yeah. Anytime we're at a show, he loves it. <laughs> um, so we are back here at SEPC's Southern Exposure in beautiful Tampa, Florida, and I'm being joined by my good friend Robert Gunther from Break 365. Robert? Great. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, for being here, man. Yeah, this is great. It's good uh, to see you. Other delays and some crazy travel, and right. but we're here. Right. right. Uh, it's my first time for this uh, event. You're kidding. Yeah. You know, for the work I did, I didn't really have much of a reason to come down is really, you know, this is such a uh, retail sales type mm -hmm. of conference, uh, but it's been great to be here. Uh, I mean, I've seen so many, you know, friends and colleagues and gotten to reconnect with a bunch of folks. So it's been nice to be it's like here. like a big family reunion. Yeah. 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 And yeah. It's, it's interesting being on this side as a, as a participant versus you know, like running a show like when, in my past with United. And I, 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 I call it, a, you know, being a consumer of the show, right. right. Versus an a, right. A, a organizer, which when you're in the middle of it, even stuff like this, you never really quite know how it's going. Right. Until afterwards, or if you actually, you know, right. we all have our trusted, you know, advisors, so to right. speak. But it never feels like it's going off smoothly, especially when yeah. you they, see, see how the sausage is made. Yeah. 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 It's <laughs> interesting to look at it from this side than, you know, being behind the scenes and making sure that things are running as smoothly as they can. There's, yeah. But there's always hiccups, but all these shows, everybody seems very happy, excited to be here. And it's like a lot of business is getting done. Oh, definitely. This is the... The daddy of the regional shows, I yeah. call it. They do a great job. Yeah. Um, 1999, I believe, um, the show started. So I started coming shortly thereafter. I haven't been in a number of years. But so Breakthrough 365, yep. Robert, for those that don't know right. your company, what do you do? What are you, you know, who, who, sure. who should be calling you? Who shouldn't be calling you? <laughs> and we'll get into kind of the DC sure. stuff. What's, what's hot right now? Hot topics. I mean, I, I have my own kind of point of view on... Oh, well, it's a election year. It's not an election. Like why you can and can't right. get things done in D.C. So right. I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Sure. But tell us a little bit more about Breakthrough 365. So right? as you know, Ed and others know, um, I had spent the last 24, 25 years uh, working with the Trade Association World and Fresh Produce. So mm -hmm. running government relations in Washington, D.C. And it was just a dream job. I uh, never thought I would fall into that space. But working for this industry uh, in that capacity really was something that that i just you know again it just it, representing this industry in washington dc and other places but more so in dc uh in, in front of elected officials administration officials you know was just a great honor to do but it was time i think to kind of see what else is out there mm -hmm. i felt that i really wanted to get a little deeper in some of the issues uh that i you know really wasn't able to get as deep into. Uh, so Breakthrough 365 came up. And, and really, the reason we named the, 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 the firm this is because we want to break through the clutter, break through all the challenges in, in, in DC and, and get results. Mm -hmm. I think developing a small firm, you can really engage with your, your, your clients uh, in a different way than you can through a trade association. You can tackle issues that Quite frankly, may not raise the top of priorities for the folks in D.C., but you can continue to highlight those and, and fix problems. I, I came to Washington, D.C. I started working on the Hill in 1989. Yes, 1989. And I remember being a Hill staffer for about 10 years before I went to United Fresh to run the government relations team. You know, we were always looked at to, to you know, we worked bipartisanly at that time, fixing problems. People would come to you. Here's our challenge. Here's our issues. And, you know, you'd get a bunch of you know, staffers or members of Congress together who wanted to solve these problems and, and go at it and fix it. That's changed a lot now that, that the dynamics have changed in D.C. as you hear and see every day. But I do still think there's opportunities to to engage in ways that are effective for um, for the industry, for the clients, you know, my clients. But, you know, so I'm excited. I'm excited about this. I, I started this in October. I've got a good set of clients already. You know, just, I've got a lot of different issues I'm working on that, quite frankly, I didn't get a chance to work on at, you know, really? at the trade association. So I like what you said about prioritizing, right? Yeah. So you're able to prioritize um, those clients' needs, which if you don't have a presence in Washington and have never been, you need one. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've, I've 
my trips are far and few between, but I've been uh, to the policy conference several times. Um, it is politically charging for, mm -hmm. you know, you come back sure. a little bit more kind of pumped up. It's kind of like watching Rocky or uh, right. we talked about watching Top Gun 2 on the way right. here. Right. Um, so it gets you pumped up. But yeah, it's um, it's a different world, you know, and if you don't know the ins and outs, I mean, frankly, for me, sometimes it's a little bit discouraging. I felt like, you know, we, we, we talk about the same issues. Um, and then I briefly mentioned a little bit ago that, you know, it's whether or not Congress is in session, they're not in session, you know, it's an election year, it's not an election year, it's the year right. after an election. Right. I mean, what is the sweet spot? Is there one year out of a presidential term that... Um, Usually the first year. Really? Yeah. And if you look, I, I've never really been asked that question, but my instincts would say your first year because no matter if you're getting, you know, no, no matter if it's a new new administration coming in, that first year, they're going to have a lot of that energy and support behind them mm -hmm. uh, from the country, uh, hopefully from from you know their supporters in Congress, to really set the agenda for what they want to do for the the next uh, the four years that they're in, in session or you know in, in in the White House. So I think that's really one of those. Uh, if you put me, you know, kind of press me on that, it'd be the first year. It gets tricky this year, and you know. In terms of presidential election, mm -hmm. the further we get into the spring and the summer, you know, the less likely we're going to be able to um, action on any major issues. So major issues. Yeah. Farm bill. Immigration. Immigration. Child and nutrition. Child, environmental issues. You know, regulatory reform. All of that is, is really uh, top of mind, you know, for, for every year, for, mm -hmm. so for, for every Congress and for, for the industry, quite frankly. So I think that when you look at the programs and the opportunities for industry, I still think things are looking up. The Farm Bill is a great opportunity to... Has there been anything added to the farm? I know that it sure. grows, right? Has there anything been added recently that would be of particular interest? So the last, Yeah, so the last time the Farm Bill was reauthorized was 2018. So right now we're in the middle of the Farm Bill debate uh, in, in Congress. So it's the goal of this, you know, to have a Farm Bill passed by the end of this year. Uh, a new farm bill. Mm -hmm. So it's every five to six years, they have to reauthorize the farm bill. It's very tricky. And, and it takes five years to do it. <laughs> and it takes about five, yeah. I don't know if it takes five years, but certainly they start, you know, that, that last year mm -hmm. of, the, of the bill, they certainly, you know, get really act, active in doing farm bills. So right now, you know, a lot of the groups, Fresh Produce and, you know, and others are positioning themselves with members of Congress, the right, you know, the Senate and House Ag Committee mm -hmm. on what priorities they think are important. Uh, for them to be included in the farm bill. Um, you know, I, I, I said this uh, recently, you know, I look at the farm bill and, you know, when I first started on Capitol Hill as a staffer and then my early time at, at, at United, you know, the farm bill wasn't a big issue for our industry. You know, we did, it was the, the, the title, what we call a title one group. So the port and our cotton, corn, rice, mm -hmm. peanuts, you know, the folks, you know, that they dominated the farm bill debate. Um, you know, we have, Starting in 2002 and especially in 2008 Farm Bill, we've really uh, been able to expand our presence in the Farm Bill, where now it, it is the single largest um, uh, federal program that provides resources to our industry. So in research and food safety oh, wow. and sanitary, phytosanitary, uh, the state block grant that program. That all rolls up? That all rolls up into the Farm Bill. Oh, um, and it's about, you know, I mean, Eight nine hundred million dollars a year uh, that you see in the farm bill. So you know billions of dollars over the life. Wick, Wick is not. Really? Uh, uh, it's, it's again. It's it goes. It was in, at a point. But food, no, no. It's in child nutrition. <laughs> oh, okay. So, but it is. Wick is in. Um, it has to be funded every year through the appropriations, mm -hmm. the, the annual uh, funding uh, programs that get funded every to keep the government running. Gotcha. The SNAP program, so food is in the farm bill, mm -hmm. and that represents about 75 to 80 percent of the farm bill, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a big issue. And, and you know, well, why is a food assistance program part of the farm bill debate? Well, you know, Congress's infinite wisdom in the early 70s, they connected the two because when you look at the makeup of Congress, you know, in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, and even beyond, you know, very rural districts. Now there's less than 8% uh, of the districts that are strictly rural that really have a lot of farms in their, in their, uh, in their congressional districts. Mm -hmm. So LAP, uh, attaching something like a food stamp program, which impacts every congressional district across the country, 
it's important to urban congressional members, suburban, obviously rural, you know, that has to, that, that connection between foreign programs and food nutrition programs like SNAP bring together very unique partners in the political process to, to get enough people to pass a bill, to get enough members of Congress to pass a bill, pass the farm bill. It's there for political purposes. It's also there because it makes sense because the U.S. Department of Agriculture, they run the SNAP program. It's connected to food in so many different ways, obviously, um, with, with the folks who have to, you know, that use the SNAP program, participate in the SNAP program. So there's a good connection there. And right now, the problem that Congress has is funding. There's a lot of great ideas out there, including some from our industry, to add to the next farm bill. But there's not a lot of you know, new money, new resources out there to fund all this stuff. So they're really struggling right now to figure out what's that sweet spot of potentially finding some money somewhere to fund a bunch of new programs or add money to current programs that they really like. And then pass it so they can get support from Democrats and Republicans. It's not going to be one party or the other that's going to pass the farm bill. And if there was anything from like a new production perspective, like I'm talking about domestic growers, mm -hmm. I talk about farming almost like the steel industry. You just don't hear about people mm -hmm. just, I am going to get the steel business. It doesn't happen anymore, right? Right. Farming to a large degree as well. Yeah. But that's at the state level, right? That support. If, if, yes. If, if you were somebody that wanted to get into farming. Yeah. It's not easy. It's not easy. I, my, Family, I, I probably didn't know this. I grew up in North Central Florida, and we have a very small family farm there. It was in Citrus for a hundred years, and wow. my uh, father passed away a couple of years ago, and uh, he had converted a lot of it to peaches and plums and cool. grapes and all sorts of stuff. He just replanted just to try things out. And so when he passed away, I, you know, I'm an only child, so I had to come down and start figuring that out. It's not easy. <laughs> it's not wow. easy to figure it out. And That's uh, a big job. So I've been spending more time down here with my mom and, and the family. Fortunately, I have cousins and stuff that can help out. And yeah, it's, it's tough to get into, even when you think you've been a part of it all your life. And, but I've been looking at it, obviously, from a totally different perspective, from a policy, not a real like on-the-ground yeah. perspective. But so the answer is it would be you, somebody would require state-level support. Like there's no federal support to get from a – New production, new producers. Well, and no, there's there's like beginning farmer programs really? at USDA. Yeah, you oh. can, there are uh, that, that helps for grants and and funding and and there's. Uh, I know TDA does a lot of stuff in yeah. Texas. Yeah. So so for our industry, the states are very involved because of the state block grant program, the special crop state block program. So the states have funding that comes through the farm bill through USDA, and they then uh, are allowed to look at state local regional projects in their state to really highlight to help growers be more competitive. Uh, so that it's a wire. It's going to be marketing. Uh, it could be food safety training. It could be a whole host of different export promotion, but it could be a whole host of things that the states are focusing on that helps that our, our industry in, in each state. And it's very state specific. I always tell folks it's great, but it's also a challenge our industry. What a citrus grower in California may need to make his or her business profitable or successful is very different than what somebody, a citrus grower in Texas, and even a citrus grower here in Florida, uh, you know, needs to make their businesses. And so having the diversity of programs that we have pushed in the Farm Bill and other areas that allow the flexibility to really tap into more of the direct support to, to prop up farms, to make them more successful, is I mean, one of the there, beauties. There's a ton of interest, obviously, in, in D.C. I mean, what is, yeah. how is produce perceived? I mean, is it? Great question. I, I think, well, I'm, well, I think the, the industry is great. I mean, we have a, you know, I call us some, a lot of times the white hat. I mean, we're healthy. People mm -hmm. are interested, you know, in learning about what the new kind of, you know, fruit or vegetable is that everybody's talking about or what's coming out there online that's different. Uh, you know, they, you know, the, 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 the staffs of the, you know, people who work in government, you know, they go to the store every day and, you know, they see the brands that, you know, come to their door. You know, yeah. it's it's we, really it's so they're staffers very, several times. And in my mind, I keep thinking about the old Fresh Festival. Yeah. Yeah. Days <laughs> when the staffers would line up 
with their bag <laughs> after the uh, so there was a i don't know i guess if i'm describing it right but it was like a mini expo yep. inside the cafeteria i think it yep, was, it was i don't remember like, what building yeah but. we we moved it around okay but it was in a lot of times it was in because that was really the biggest space was so many people wanted to to come and and we we called it fresh festival on capitol hill and it had booths from i mean like a mini SEPC at some yeah. level, you know, that were giving out samples. And, but you were, you were interacting with members of Congress and a lot of staff who love going to the things that have free food and free alcohol <laughs> and needed all the and food needed. they could get. Yeah. So they just said, come with bags. Most and- of these shows, like the local food bank, you know, these organizations yeah. like SCPC, they'll yeah. work with a food bank. They'll come and they'll pick up anything yeah. that um, exhibitors don't take back with them. We, and we would work with like DC Central Kitchen. Oh, really? Speaking of, and, and the local food bank. Oh, I, thought, I just figured it all went. Yeah, no, there was actually some left, huh. you know, every now Surprising. and then. And so we did work with the local charities there to to, to, to give them support and things like that with, with what was left over. But yeah, it was quite a scene cool, back yeah. in the early days. Yeah. But it was great. It was great. Well, I kind of you know, diverted. I, we were talking about, the, we were, I don't know if you finished with, you know, your thoughts on the perception of the industry in so, DC. Speaking of the perception, the Fresh Festival was a big hit. Yeah. So you could go, you know, so they really, you know, I could, you know, as a lobbyist, as somebody who worked in D.C., I could go into an office and, you know, they may not know who I am, but, you know, some of those folks would say, oh, you got to do that Fresh Festival on Capitol Hill. <laughs> and instantly you got, you got, that's cool, you got feedback and they yeah. were interested. But I would say, yes, I think we're, we're, we're seen in high esteem. Uh, we're very popular in terms of. Uh, of you know the, the the products we make, uh, the products we we grow, mm-hmm. and I think that's translated into being very you know you know we've worked with Republican Democratic administrations, Republican Democratic Congresses, you know we're very you know our industry really crosses over a lot of the political you know dynamics that you see every day in, in Just certain some tough in, ones in certain industries struggle with that. The, I know the, you know the domestic and import. You know, yes. Uh, you know, with what's happening on the border right now, there has to be concern about continuity of supply, supply chain. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had the issue with the avocado yep. inspector, I think it was last year, and all that kind of shut down at a really bad, I think it was right around Super Bowl. Yeah. Um, really bad timing. So are you hearing concern? I mean, obviously, with our domestic growers, um, we, we just mentioned there's not a lot of folks getting into the farming business. So right. We're relying more and more. On imports, we are, and and that's you know obviously the import export issues, the challenges with with product is is always going to be there. Uh, the tension is going to be there. Uh, you know the growers here in Florida and and the South have struggled a lot, a, a lot with uh, the challenges with the foreign competition, but there also is a consumer demand that can't be met right now by the domestic industry. Mm-hmm. It, it's unfortunate, but. That's just the way it is, and that's why you've got a lot of investment going back and forth between domestic and international production. I would also argue that the the, the way that business, you, the customer, the the supplier side has changed in dynamics too. I mean, 20, 30 years ago, you had ten or fifteen different tomato suppliers that the retailer would go to. Now they want one or two. And yeah. you, you as a business got to decide if you want to be that or not. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm oversimplifying that, and there are exceptions to the rule. But I think when you look at the way that's yeah. changed, that transactional dynamic, it's also impacted the way produce moves, the supply chain moves here in the United States in particular. And year-round supply. I and mean, year-round. I, that's right. And you need to be year-round. That's what I mean. Yeah. And you got to and, – and so – When back – when we were kids, it was what's in season. I what's mean, in you season? got what's in season and – you know, when it was, it was out of season. Was, just didn't have it. You didn't care. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're not, you it's didn't care. Like you just, Kramer and the, mel- and the, oh God, I forgot what kind of, yeah. what was it? What was he eating? Was it a, mel- uh, no, Mackinac peaches. Mackinac, Mackinac peaches. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. You mentioned the border. You mentioned the labor issues. I mean, again, that's very front and center. You've seen a lot happening in Congress about whether they're going to do a, a border security a deal or not. I mean, certainly in you guys in Texas, you see it firsthand every day sure. if you're in South Texas. Uh, and I think that until we can get that resolved, we're not going to go back to helping agriculture, you know, getting an agriculture labor bill moving forward. And I hate to say that. And it's been something that, you know, this industry has consistently fought for for 30 plus years. And 
We've heard every story we can from Congress of why they can or cannot do it. It just needs some strong leadership, quite frankly. And uh, we've been close a few times, but you really need that strong leadership who's not going to blink when, when the pressure gets on from whatever groups and other your colleagues on the Hill are going to throw at you if you really want to try to do this. Mm -hmm. And too, too often lately they, they have blinked, you know, and, and they just kind of they want to pull back. So I really think that if you could get a border security type bill, tie agriculture, tie a few other areas like Dreamers to it, that's the that's the ticket at some point to kind of move something, you know, in Congress. But I don't see it. Obviously, again, election year, I don't really see certainly nothing like that happening. We were just talking about we saw a border deal that looked pretty good on paper uh, fall apart because of political pressures. And so I, I don't think it's going to be a political kind of hammer, you know, and an issue in the campaigns between now and, and November on both in the presidential election, but also in congressional elections. I mean, to say it's a huge distraction is not really fair because it's, it is what it is. I mean, yeah. it's, it's yeah. an issue. Yeah. It deserves its, but it is, takes away resources, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. To, um, it takes away uh, time, energy, and resources that can be spent on a lot of other good things. I, I'm copying on emails about weights at bridges and you know how long sure. trucks are taking to cross, and I'm like, we're we're one hiccup away yep. from just pandemonium, yep. you know, um, which is scary, right? It is, you know, and it I'm is. just we're keeping it under control right now, but with everything that's happening, right? It's scary to think that we're teetering on some very, very much, very much so. It's it's very concerning, and you know, people hear what they want to hear about the issue. Um, and make their own judgment on what's happening or not happening, uh, success or not. And it is an issue, and uh, you know, the whole range of immigration issues. It, it, this country has to, and these our political leaders have got to sit down and really try to tackle this. Mm -hmm. At some point, it's going to, because like you said, it, it's, we're teetering right now on some very significant challenges. The other thing that concerns me is transportation. Yeah. You know, I get copied on some stuff about the, the availability to load ratio and it's mm -hmm. way out of whack. There's just not folks getting into that line of work like they did when they came back from Vietnam or right. out of service or right. My father was in transportation and he's since retired, but um, a lot of owner operators back in the seventies, eighties, nineties. They're you know, not there anymore. They're not there anymore. I learned how to drive a semi in the backfield of, you know, our property and kind of just right. turned me loose and right. you know, somewhat half figured it out and he taught me and that's how you just yeah people just don't have those opportunities they don't you will um, so that concerns me a lot yeah the, the way the transportation infrastructure and again to your what you said the lack of, of, of folks who are interested in going into that type of, of, of business whether you're a owner operator or you're working for a large firm we're I mean, we saw so much happen we learned we learned so much what happened in COVID. You know, we mm -hmm. learned about the supply chains across all sectors of business that we never even, I think, thought of you know, in terms of <laughs> what could happen. I talk about stockouts at retail. I mean, it would be like grounds for termination, and I've never seen a stockout <laughs> before. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's yeah. just, it's a thing. And, and you know, it, it's almost, I almost feel like at some level we've, gotten away from we've not forgotten about it but we forgot what was going on at that moment and that juncture of what happened in the global marketplace i wish we could do more i mean i really do I, even in the agriculture and the food space i i you know if if i was had a magic wand i would have a supply chain critical infrastructure title of the farm bill be new title yeah because of what happened what was happening and and it's still not correct i mean completely fixed but it, it fascinates me that more attention has not been paid in this farm bill uh that we're talking about now that based on what happened during the covid covid years on the good side <laughs> this was a good week for the, the fresh produce industry in, in dc okay a couple things as i mentioned the federal funding bill the appropriation the ag appropriations bill passed congress uh it had some good things in there. The WIC program was fully funded. That was a big issue for quite some time. There was that's be fully... annual, you said? Yes, that's an annual okay. uh, funding bill. 
and that's when you talk, you hear government shutdowns and they're going to shut down or not. Mm -hmm. This th these are the bills that they're they they are uh, passing. They have to pass each year to keep the government running. So either they're going to pass a new bill that has new funding for the next year, or they're going to just keep the current programs and do what they call a continuing resolution. Again, we don't need to get into that. But mm -hmm. they did pass the bill. It had full funding of WIC. Uh, congratulations to a lot of the groups that spent a lot of time in that because it really would have impacted uh, fresh produce in terms of the availability of fresh produce for those who participate in the WIC program. When you start slashing money in a program like that, the first things that are going to be looked at to reduce is those products, quite frankly, that are more expensive. And fresh produce is expensive, but we've been fortunate as an industry, uh, with the work that you know United, IFPA, and others have done of, of building a solid case or having more investments in WIC funding to help them purchase or, or have fruits and vegetables for young children and, and, and mothers. But we're far away from making a mandate, right? I mean, I know oh, no, that's not, like a dream. You mean like a mandate of healthy foods? Certain percentage, yeah. Yes, yes, we are. And, and, and you're up WIC's against... the closest thing to it, though. WIC, okay. WIC, 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 is quote unquote almost a prescription. A certain amount of money can be funded for, for fruits and vegetables, dairy, cheese, other products, okay. other types of products. So that was successful in that bill, got fully funded. The actual, the program that funds the urban ag and, and innovation uh, office at USDA, that had been slashed to zero. That got funded at I think seven and a half million dollars. And that's really to help some of the controlled environment growers. It helps them have a presence at USDA and, and look at programs throughout USDA that can be channeled through that office and help those people who are trying to grow that part of the of the, of the, of the business. Um, we also, in the House Ag Committee, speaking of Farm Bill, but the House Ag Committee just released this week their bipartisan set of recommendations on ag, ag labor reform. That was established last year, and they did a lot of, of, of work listening to different sectors of agriculture. And there's some really good ideas in there. And whenever you can get, especially in the House, Democrats and Republicans agreeing on agriculture labor, that's important. It's a big deal. Yeah. I mean, now now the next step is taking those policy or, you know, creating legislation and all that stuff. But, but garnering interest is... Yes, but having the Ag Committee focus on ag labor because the Farm Bill cannot fix ag labor. You know, a lot of people ask that. And... You know, why can't you just put ag labor reform in the farm? Well, it doesn't fit in there. It's not the jurisdiction of the ag committee. It's the other labor committee. committee. Yeah, another committee kind of helps develop that legislation and pass it. So, you know, this is the closest they could probably get to, to really weighing in. So we'll see what happens with it uh, in terms of those recommendations if it comes to develop. Well, labor is huge, but obviously a solved labor issue, ag labor issue, could promote more new production, new producers. 100%. Right. Um, water, I, I don't even think, we don't have time for water. We're going to have to do, yeah. we're going to have to do another show on water. Yeah. I, I'm not sure how up to date you keep on the Mexico. Oh, I've, I've heard a lot. Okay. Some of our good friends in South Texas yeah. keep me up to so date. There's on. a lot, a lot going on there. But um, before we, before we go, I highly encourage anyone that hasn't been to Washington, even if they've been on a um, family trip per se, but really on a more focused uh, basis, you know, uh, seek out Robert, attend IFPA. I think it's moved now. In I don't June. know. The first okay, week it's moved June. to June. Yep. Yep. Um, IFPA's policy conference, uh, highly recommend it. Connect with somebody that knows their way around. I've just always assumed this, but you worked with John McClung at one point, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. so. Yeah. Uh, John, one of my mentors. <laughs> same. John yeah. was one of the first friendly faces I met when I moved to South Texas over yeah. 20 years ago. Super good man. I miss him. Walking on the hill with him was like, he was a rock star. Yeah, he is. Yeah, I mean, he really, he just came to life, you know, when he was there. So well, let me make a, one more. I know we got to go, but let me make one more plug about, you know, attending the Washington conference. I was part of that conference since its very beginning. And when I first started at United, I mean, it's become the, 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 the center point of the fresh produce industries, you know, days on Capitol Hills. And it really does make a big difference. For those in D.C., whether you're me or IFPA staff or other associations that represent fresh produce, you know, having the industry come together one time a year to go to the Hill, talk about their issues, 
I know sometimes it, it feels frustrating and people bang their head up against the wall after they've been to these offices, but it does make a big difference for us, for all of us who work in this in that area every day, you know, of the year representing the, the industry. So I highly, to your point, Ed, I highly recommend you, you uh, trying to attend this year or the industry trying to attend this year. Um, the and, move and the date, uh, the what what was the reasoning behind it, you know? Was that something that happened before you? I, I, no, it was planned before okay. before I left. September had become such a volatile month in, in Washington, D.C. I mean, especially during election years. I go back yeah. to that. I mean, we've had the government shut down during yeah. the middle of the conference. Yeah. And, you know, it's just been all these different things that have happened. You know, I, September's a funky month. I, June is a very nice sweet spot because a lot can happen in June. Oh, I like it. I, I, and, and the weather's better. I have you two know. kids. One's older now, yeah. but one in high school still. Yeah. And when he was in high school, I always wanted to take him, but it was football season. Yeah, or football. So he, yeah. You know, he so he never football. could go. He played football. And yeah. so now that it's in June, my daughter's a freshman in high school. Yeah. Like, I want to take her with so yeah. she can be exposed to. No, it's great. I think the move's going to be great for the, the conference, for the industry. And I think, you know, if, if you know, folks that are listening to this, if they can make it there, you know, please do so. Um, you will get a lot of value by helping the end. You will understand better. Everybody in this convention and, and, and outside are touched by the government in some way. I know mm, that sure. you don't think so, but if, you know, some engaged. people don't think so. But, so if you don't get engaged, you can't really complain about it. Right. Robert, before we go, how can people find you? Uh, you can contact me uh, on email at rgunther at btgr365.com. That's probably the best way to reach out to me. Okay. Uh, I've got my website up and or coming soon, hopefully. I'll be promoting that as well uh, down the road. And you can find me on LinkedIn. Just search my name and connect to me that way as well. So I appreciate it. All right. Thanks. thanks for being with us. Ed, thanks. We'll be right back.